see the screen. Okay. So thanks everyone for joining this call. Uh, so this is uh, part of our series of talks on uh, uh, which we are doing for celebrating Engineers Day. In India, we celebrate Engineers Day on 15th of September, which happens to be the uh, birthday of Sir M. Vishweshwaraya. So far, we have done uh, seven talks. This is the eighth talk in this series. And today we are going to be talking about why we are not doing microservices a Devopedia case study. So this talk itself is brought to you by Devopedia, which is a community of developers. And uh, Devopedia as a platform is partly inspired by Wikipedia, where collaboratively uh, developers share their knowledge of uh, different uh, technologies, be it software, hardware, architecture, or design, uh, coding in any language, uh, or uh, whether it's front end, uh, back end, or full stack. So uh, we cover a wide uh, breadth of technology. And uh, along with the platform, we also host events like these. Uh, previously, we used to do classroom uh, instructor led workshops. And now we have started doing uh, you know, virtual talks and tutorials like this. So I will, of course, talk a little bit more about Devopedia because uh, the, the nature of this talk is we are going to use Devopedia as a case study. And using that case study, we will introduce what microservices are and why we are not doing microservices. So obviously, you will get to know more about Devopedia during the course of the talk. In fact, the talk will start with an uh, overview of uh, the platform. So a few words about uh, myself. Uh, I founded Devopedia back in uh, 2017, uh, January. And the domain itself was registered, you know, in December 2016. So, uh, yeah, it's been uh, four and a half years uh, since we started Devopedia. Before uh, starting Devopedia, I was involved uh, mainly in the telecom sector. I worked in telecom for more than uh, 12 years. And after, uh, you know, working for so many years in telecom, I thought uh, maybe a change would be nice. So I got into community activities uh, and that led me to starting Devopedia. So Devopedia is managed by uh, uh, what is called the Devopedia Foundation. It's a non-profit organization and there are four trustees who are managing the foundation. So that's the introduction for of Devopedia. Now let's get into the main talk. So the title of the talk is why we are not using microservices a Devopedia case study. Uh, before getting into uh, you know the details of the talk, it will be nice to have an overview of what Devopedia is as a platform. So I'm going to launch uh, Devopedia on the browser. So this is the website which is hosted at uh, devopedia.org. And as you can see, uh, there are a number of articles which are already published on the platform. So here is three recently published articles, continuous delivery, IoT security model, IoT security, and then some popular articles, Python data structures, DevOps, container orchestration, an article on testing, shift left, an article on security types of blockchains, an article on languages or data structures. So let's go to one of these articles as an example and see uh, what is behind this link. So this is the typical way an article is presented to our readers. Uh, you have a menu on the left and then you have the main content of the article in the middle column. And on the right, you have some uh, you know relevant meta metadata of that article, some tags and other related articles. So every article starts with a summary. Then there is a discussion, you know, for someone who wants uh, to go into the details of this topic, they can look at the discussion, which is organized as a Q&A. So here the author has identified, you know, a bunch of questions and they have, uh, he or she has answered those questions. Then we have milestones, like how this particular topic has progressed. So. Uh, 
uh, it started in you can say it started in 2000 uh, one of the milestones is 2006 then april 2013 something happened and so forth so uh, somebody can log into the system for example i can log in through my facebook and uh, once i am logged into devopedia i can go back to that article or let's say i go to another article iot security and I will be able to edit this article. So because it's a collaborative platform, anybody who has a login will now be able to edit this article. So just because one author created this article, it doesn't mean that only he or she has the permissions to edit the article. Now, uh, new authors, uh, you know, they may not be very uh, well versed or experienced in uh, editing articles. So. Uh, typically, the edits will go through a moderation. There are a bunch of moderators who will moderate the edits before the changes go live. And uh, you can always, you know, do a preview. So for authors, there are a bunch of facilities like you can do a preview of what you have edited. You can diff compare the current version with the previous version, or you can look at all the different versions of this article. If you wish, you can compare a particular version with the previous version. So these are some of the functionalities or features that we have on the system. So this is uh, essential for us to move ahead. Uh, and of course you have users. So I am one of the users. Uh, I'm also an author here and I have a profile page. Let's say this is a public profile page which everyone sees. So everyone uh, can see this public profile page as long as I made my profile public. And I have gathered because I do a lot of editing. I have gathered a lot of gold badges. I have some silver badges and some bronze badges. And uh, what else? Uh, yeah, these are all my contributions, articles, the chats in which I have participated. And uh, for every edit that I make, the system rewards me with what is called dev coins. So every author you know, is rewarded uh, based on their contributions. And these dev coins are also used to, you know, prepare the leader leaderboard. So right now I am the top editor on Devopedia, but there are many other editors, right? So Guru Murthy, Anuradha, Mohanjo, and so forth. So these are the other editors uh, who are uh, editing quite often on the system. So this is an overview of uh, Devopedia. With this understanding, we will be able to understand the talk. So why we are not using microservices? So I've already explained to you what Devopedia is. So it's basically a knowledge sharing pl uh, platform inspired partly by Wikipedia. We collaborate on content and editing. One of the things we try to do is, uh, which is very different from Wikipedia is, uh, we try to emphasize simple explanations. And uh, we try to avoid difficult words or uh, you know very uh, difficult technical jargon. Where technical jargon is used in articles, we encourage authors to use, you know, try to explain that jargon before using it in that article. Now, Wikipedia itself is built on what is called the wiki software. Uh, many of you may be familiar with that, uh, uh, but Devopedia is not built on wiki software. We have built it as a responsive web app because that's what we felt to, uh, made more sense uh, for what we are doing. And wiki software is, uh, of course, very powerful, but we felt that we wanted something simpler. And because, uh, you know, everything these days is an app, uh, you know, it was it made more sense to build it as a responsive web app. And as I mentioned in the introduction, it's managed by Devopedia Foundation. So what is the background architecture, software architecture on which uh, Devopedia is uh, built? We, I, uh, we already saw that it's a responsive web app. What is the framework that we are using? More than a framework, we are using the Joomla uh, uh, content management system. And the Joomla content management system is an MVC architecture. So some of you may or may not know what is MVC. MVC stands for Model View Controller. So we'll get into this uh, right away. What is a model, what is the view, and what is a controller? But to understand this, we need some understanding of how the web works. And uh, most of you will be familiar how the web works, but for completeness, we'll give a brief overview of how the web works. 
So most of the web is built as a client server architecture, which means that your browser is the client and there is a web server which is uh, you know uh, standing in between your content and your database. So the web server is sort of the intermediary to the web browser. So web browser or your client makes a request, which is typically a URL. So when the request comes to the web browser, the web browser do does a bunch of things. Uh, the web server, sorry, the web server does a bunch of things. And behind the web server, you have what we call the model view controller. This is the Joomla architecture. So the request first comes to uh, you know the controller. The controller doesn't have access to the data. The data is typically, let's say, in a database. So uh, to give you an example, uh, let's look at Devopedia as an example. We have a bunch of articles. We have a bunch of registered users. And we have people commenting on those articles, liking those articles. All that is data. And all the data is stored in a database. So when a user uh, requests a particular article to be displayed on their uh, web browser, the controller goes and fetches that article from the database. And the controller doesn't also have direct access to the database. So it uses, it gets access to the data via what is known as the model. So you can say that the model is sort of the intermediary to the database. So what does the model contain? The model contains a bunch of business rules. For example, it could say that you know, the length of the article should not exceed you know, 5,000 characters or the title should not contain special characters. So those are the kind of business rules which you can put into the model. So model does all kinds of validation on the data. Another example could be that the title should not exceed you know, 256 characters. So that could be part of the model. So that kind of validation happens in the model before data is saved into the database. On the reverse path, when we are trying to display the data, the model simply reads the data from the database. It may or may not do uh, additional checks uh, depending on what is the kind of request that is coming in. And then that data is given back to the controller. What does the controller do with the data? The data is in kind of a raw form. It might be an array, uh, it might be a string. Uh, that is typically not suitable for sending it back to the client. So at least this is how it works in the Joomla uh, MVC model. So you have to package this data into a HTML uh, format and that format is given to the web browser. Remember uh, what browsers display is typically HTML uh, format. So the data is packaged on the server into a HTML format, but this is not again done by the controller. Controller gets the data from the model and then it gives it to what is known as the view. So every view is backed by a bunch of layouts. Uh, so for example, the article page may be having a certain layout. The home page will have a certain layout. When you edit the article, a different layout comes in. When you are going to the user profile, a different layout comes in. Each of that is a layout. And these layout, uh, layouts are accessed through the view. So what the controller does is it takes the data from the model, gives it to the view, view uses the layout and gives back the response. Controller gives this response through the web server back to the web browser and you get the page that you wanted. I hope this uh, is clear to you. The reason I'm showing you this uh, is it's very important for us to un understand that although Joomla MVC is a monolithic architecture, you know, we will get down to the uh, details of what is monolithic and what is not. But because everything is running on the same server, we call it a mono monolithic architecture. But inside the monolithic architecture, there is a, a lot of abstraction going on. It's not that everything is happening in a single file or a single folder. There is a quite a lot of organization that goes on inside the MVC architecture. And we found uh, how this is useful. Controller does the uh, uh, basically the dispatching to the correct model, dispatching to the correct view, bringing all those things together. Model interfaces to the database, view interfaces to the different layouts. And you know the web browser does the main interaction with the uh, sorry web server does the main interaction with the web browser. 
So this is what we have on a MVC architecture. I will pause here for a couple of uh, maybe a minute uh, if, if there are any questions. If not, we'll move on. OK, we can have the questions later on. Yeah, we'll move on to the next slide. Now we saw what is MVC as implemented in Joomla. But the Joomla also introduces a bunch of other useful abstractions. The main four abstractions are components, modules, plugins, templates. We will not get into uh, you know, the purpose of each of these abstractions uh, because that is not the core part of this uh, presentation. Uh, suffice it to note that uh, components have all three parts of the MVC. It has the model, view and the controller. All three are involved in components. Whereas in templates, templates is typically uh, what we called as layouts here. They are all always usually backed by certain template. So one template will give a certain look and feel for the website. Another template will give a different look and feel. So templates relate to only the view. They don't relate typically to the model or the controller. Then you have modules. Again, modules typically have only the view part. They, they don't deal with the model or the controller. Then there are plugins. So what are plugins? Very easy to understand. You see when a request comes from the web browser, there is a certain flow that happens. The way data flows, it goes to the controller, it goes to the model, comes, comes back to the controller, goes to the view, comes back to the controller, then it goes to the server, server responds. So in this flow, the plugins can uh, do their job. So plugin can and the plugin can execute at any point during this process flow. It can execute here or here or here. So it all depends, uh, you know, on the context of the plugin. Uh, so uh, there are plugins for user authentication. There are plugins for uh, content management. Uh, there are system plugins. There are search plugins. So there are so many different type of plugins in Joomla. And the nature of the plugin will dictate exactly where it executes. The, these are the useful abstractions in Joomla. Uh, we will look at an example of components in the code uh, shortly. Next up is the architecture of Devopedia. So this is how this is what Joomla CMS provides. So what is it that we have done on top of this to make the Devopedia web app? So look at this slide uh, block diagram where the Joomla content management system that we have seen so far is enclosed in this orange box. So we have the MVC core to which we have a MySQL database. Then there is custom code that we have written as part of Devopedia. So these, uh, this custom code typically resides in four folders, libraries, which is common code, then we have three plugins, content plugin, system plugin, and user plugins. So this is the Devopedia custom code, which is customized for our article management and user management. Then we have the interfaces. So we call them GUI layer, API layer, and CLI layer. It will be obvious to most people, most developers, what these are. So if you are a visitor to, uh, let's say, uh, Devopedia, most users are visitors. How do they arrive at Devopedia? They might do a Google search for a particular article. And then search results, they will click. They will act. So basically, they are accessing Devopedia through their web browser, which is the GUI layer. Then there is another set of users who are already registered as an author. So they will log in and they will access again through their web browser. So they are also using the GUI layer. So when Devopedia was launched, uh, you know, this is all we had. We did not have the CLI layer or the API layer. So these came later. So now the question will be, why do you need an API layer? So there could be a third kind of client, which is an authorized app. So what could be an authorized app? Uh, so to give you an example, uh, lately we have been building machine learning models. So most of these models, they run offline and sometimes they run asynchronously. So what do these models do? Uh, so they may be doing heavy textual processing uh, related to N, uh, NLP. And when the result is ready, they would like to update the main system. 
so the way to update their main system is to use the api layer so they are so these uh, machine learning models are part of an authorized app when the model results are ready they will use the api layer to update the joomla system so the use of this api layer is pretty clear now it should be pretty clear but the question will arise why do we need the cli layer so this is a bit, a bit of a legacy code you can say because when we started introducing the cli layer the api layer did not exist and it was easier to build the cli layer than to build the api layer but uh, having said that you know it's perfectly possible that we in future we may uh, discard the cli layer and everything will be done through the api layer so the question is exactly what does the cli layer do today so i'll give you a typical uh, scenario on devopedia let's say an author comes to an article and edits an article what happens uh, simple thing when the edit uh, editor author submits the article the system the devopedia system which is actually the core here it will do a bunch of validation on the article if the article has no errors no warnings then it will save a new version of the article and uh, after saving the new version it will do a bunch of other stuff what are this other stuff uh, for example it will notify the author notify moderators via emails plus uh, what else it does it goes and parses the uh, content of the article and extracts all the acronyms so we have a separate uh, table for managing acronyms so it goes and updates the table with the new acronyms or modified acronyms then uh, it might you know uh, trigger machine learning models so there is a lot of other stuff that happens and many of this stuff may be compute intensive it may take anywhere from few seconds to a couple of minutes so we don't want the user to wait for all this processing to happen uh, you know because the user will be completely lost what the user needs on the browser is interactivity so the response to the uh, new version should come back you know within a second or within a couple of seconds so that is the kind of responsiveness we want on the system so for that reason the cli layer was introduced so things like uh, sending out emails are handed off to the to a background task and those tasks all happen through the cli layer so they are all running in separate processes as background jobs while the main system gives back the response to the user saying that your edit has gone through this is the new version of the article and the uh, author can continue editing the article he can continue editing and creating an, another new version meanwhile the cli layer uh, has already triggered processes to do other background jobs so i hope it is now clear what is the purpose of the different layers we have the gui layer the api layer and the cli layer and we have some custom code that we have built on top of the joomla uh, cms system okay let's look at some code and if you have questions uh, we will uh, i will give you an opportunity to ask questions let's look at some code first okay i will switch to my vs code which is the editor i have so this is a typical joomla installation and you can see here there are a lot of folders we will focus on only three folders one uh, i mean two folders uh, yeah three folders here we have components here we have modules and we have plugins and templates so i told i uh, you know we saw in one of the earlier slides that there are four main abstractions that uh, joomla introduces so these are the ones modules plugins templates and then uh, components there are also layouts uh, but uh, we will not cover that separately so let's look at component uh, there are so many components out here uh, we will focus on one of these components called com content so all the articles that we see on devopedia they are part of the component called content let's uh, open up this folder and we see here a bunch of things immediately it will be apparent that this is a mvc model so we have a controllers here we have models and we have the views 
So as an example, let's look at the controller for an article. So what does it look like? What kind of code it contains? It contains a bunch of functions. Uh, let's say this is a allow edit. It's a protected function. We may be more interested in public functions. So edit. So when a, a Devopedia author comes and starts to edit an article, this is the function that will be called. So this is an edit function. Then what else? Uh, get model. Remember our earlier block diagram, we saw that the controller interacts with the model. So this is one of the interactions where we are trying to get the model. Let's look at some more functions. Draft. So authors can save an article as a draft. If they don't want to save it as a new version, they can save it as an intermediate draft. So then this particular uh, function gets called and so forth. Uh, so there will be a function for saving the article. So when the art, uh, author submits the new version for uh, saving, then this gets called. So basically controller, you know, maps, what controller basically does is maps the URLs to a particular function which is executed. That's the job of the controller. Let's look at the model example things that a model does. So this is an example of a model file. And as you can see here, you get the item from the database. You get it through the primary key. And here, this is where you open up the connection to the database. So all this code is in PHP. So that is what we are seeing here, the PHP code. And so forth. And you can see the query, uh, you know, the database query being formed here. From statement, select statement, inner join, where, and so forth. And uh, eventually, you know, the query will be executed and the results will be uh, Send back to the, I mean, all this is happening from within the controller, but it is actually getting, uh, doing all this through the model. So we are inside the model file. Next up, uh, I want to show you how a view file looks like. So let's take again article as an example. This is a view template, uh, view.html.php. So here a bunch of logic is there, but it it's easier for us to look at a particular template that uh, I mean, this is not template in the Joomla uh, uh, lingo. I mean, this is uh, the name of the folder they have given it. So let's look at uh, an example uh, view file. You can see here, unlike the earlier files that we saw in um, model and co component, the view file has a lot of HTML code, which is what is expected of a view file. Because remember, a view file is actually uh, populating uh, data into a HTML format. I mean, reformatting data into HTML and sending it back to the client. So it is uh, expected that a view file has a lot of HTML code. And that is what we are seeing here. So I showed you this as an example of uh, you know uh, what happens inside a Joomla component. You have all three parts, controller, models, and views. Let's take an example of a template, not a template. Let's take an example of a model, module. So for a module, uh, you know, you, we could take, let's say a footer as a module. You can see here, there is a bunch of code and uh, it goes to a layout. So basically footer uh, modules typically deal with only the view. They don't deal so much with the models and controllers. So I'm just trying to map the Joomla uh, abstractions to the MVC model. So at this point, I will pause and I will allow people to ask questions. Any questions at this point? Because after this, we will be getting into microservices. We have seen what is Joomla, how it is structured. We have seen what is Devopedia. Next, we will see why we are doing it like this and what, what uh, microservices and can bring to the table. Yeah, can you show the architecture diagram? Yes. Yeah, now how, how are also, 
how are this gui layer and uh, cli are invoked so gui layer is uh, 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 is the default layer when anyone goes to their web browser it is the gui layer that kicks in but you also mentioned something happens in the background through cli layer how does that happen yeah so you see the, there is this arrow here between the orange box and the cli layer so let's assume that a registered user goes and edits a joomla article and a new version is created so this joomla will send back the response to the gui before sending back the response it will use the cli layer to trigger background tasks okay okay so it is a, by change of state so it is, uh, the call the... is coming from the right it is not coming from the api layer right. the call to the cli layer is coming from joomla system and it will trigger the cli layer for all the background tasks and then it will send the response back to the gui so cli layer means you know yeah you are invoking a certain script huh? yes Python. we are basically because our system is php we are basically invoking a php script and in a different process exactly that is a very uh, good observation that you have made so the cli layer in every uh, invocation of the cli layer creates a independent process and the reason for that is once the joomla core sends back the response to the browser that main process is going to get destroyed that is okay. not going to wait around for these guys to finish so these guys are executing independently you know it may be one or two processes typically and they are running it as a background job and they may complete in few seconds uh, typically they will complete in few seconds yeah sure thank you any other questions so if not uh, let's move on to uh, microservices so we have understood that this whole thing is a monolith in the sense that you know everything is deployed as one unit everything is developed by one unit possibly by a single team and uh, you know it's part of the single code base uh, so what we saw here we saw that code here this whole thing is a single code base it's part of part of a single uh, git repository so in that sense it is a monolith so now the question may arise you know uh, there is so much talk about microservices and the you know benefits of microservices so question will arise uh, why when mo monoliths make sense in fact devopedia uh, you know is quite popular among developers and uh, uh, yeah. every month we get more traffic than the previous month so once you know one of the people in the community uh, who is a well known uh, guy in the in devops he asked me what uh, cloud platform that we use so a lot of people automatically assume that you know in the back end devopedia is using microservices but you know there is still uh, there, there is still a place for monoliths and uh, this slide is uh, all about that uh, so uh, devopedia is a startup for a startup with limited resources microservices are hard to build secondly release an mvp quickly uh, even today sometimes i wonder how it happened so the, i got the idea for devopedia on 24th of december 2016 the app was built in just two days and i call that an mvp so the idea was to build an app as quickly as possible and get it into the hands of uh, your users in our case it's developers but although the app was built in 2 days we did not release it for another 2 weeks and the reason was quite a lot of documentation goes uh, went into uh, the app before releasing it to the public so a lot of the 2 weeks was spent actually in the documentation not so much on building the app so uh, specifically you know every app requires uh, terms of use privacy policy these two are more or less mandatory today for any decent app out in the market on top of that for devopedia we had to uh, uh, 
you know give authors a lot of guidelines how to write a decent article so a lot of effort went into creating the author guidelines so the first uh, product that went out into the market the first version that went out into the market actually a lot of time was spent in creating the documentation rather than the actual code then uh, no experience of building distributed systems so in the in our case you know i was the only developer uh, when i started so i didn't have any uh, experience in building microservices even today my experience is quite limited so uh, you know if we have to get an mvp out to the market quickly you should uh, you know use technology that you are familiar with so that is uh, you know uh, that is the reason why i adopted uh, joomla the beauty of joomla is there are a lot of templates out there i mean not just uh, from this perspective of distributed uh, systems but also the last part you know we are well versed in a particular framework and we can employ it effectively so in my case i was already uh, you know uh, kind of intermediate to expert level in the use of joomla and the beauty of joomla is it comes with a lot of uh, free templates there are a lot of templates out in the market so as a developer i have to focus on the actual code the business logic of the app rather than worrying about the css rules and you know the shading or the shadows or the kind of font to use so those were those are important naturally they are important for a good website but this is where you know joomla helps because a lot of templates are already out in the market and i didn't want to spend time you know creating a responsive template when i can use templates off the shelf from the market so that is one of the main reasons why i adopted joomla because Uh, i can focus on the business logic of the site and of course you know when you are starting your uh, app you know you are launching it freshly into the market don't expect it to be uh, you know pokemon go where you will get uh, millions of users within the first month so there were uh, even today we don't have a lot of users that we are hitting performance bottlenecks so for these reasons it made us made a lot of sense for us to release devopedia as a monolith and even today we are running it as a monolith because we have not hit a scale where microservices are warranted so now the natural question is where microservices are helpful okay before getting into that let's look at the evolution of uh, devopedia naturally every app starts very simply right you especially if you are launching it as an mvp it's understood that you know you will not have a lot of features you are going to release a very basic app but an app that works without uh, major bugs an app that is usable and uh, an app that you know maybe excites users so our initial app had only this three parts articles and for these articles there is something called versioning which fortunately comes as part of joomla cms every article is versioned uh, so you can always do a diff between uh, one version and the previous version then you have user management you know uh, users can create an account log in log out and you know you can uh, figure out uh, you know who are the users who authored specific articles and so forth then there are comments to those articles so this is something that i added uh, on top of joomla cms because comments to articles was not enabled by default was not coming by default but there are third party extensions to joomla which will allow you to add comments to articles in our case we didn't use a third party extension uh, it was custom built within devopedia so this is how you know the app was in january 2017 but how is the app today just look at the changes that has happened one of the authors suggested that uh, you know he doesn't want to save the article immediately he wants private drafts so we introduce drafts as a feature somebody said i want to log in through my google account or my facebook or twitter accounts okay so we introduce social login then we felt that you know uh, some people start introducing spam you know they are not genuinely authoring articles but they are uh, trying to advertise their stuff through devopedia 
so then we felt that you know a review system has to be in place then locks likes acronym management requests workshops badges dev coins ml models so what was initially a very simple app over time it has gathered a lot of features whether you like it or not every simple app eventually is going to become complex so what does uh, jigstra have to say about this simplicity is a great virtue but it requires hard work to achieve it and education to appreciate it and to make matters worse complexity sells better so what started off as a simple app uh, you know even in the case of devopedia has become pretty complex you can see you know the number of different things that happen in the system so naturally you know when complexity increases it becomes difficult for one person to manage the system now probably you need a team of few people to manage the system and then different technologies are used a lot of this stuff is on php but then when it comes to ml we start introducing python and then these ml models are running on the cloud so again complexity increases how do we manage these things this is where microservices comes into picture so we have covered quite a lot of what has been there in the monolithic architecture of devopedia now we come to the uh, microservices so let's take an example of uh, instead of devopedia let's take the example of let's say e-commerce website what happens in an e-commerce website uh, you know you have ui don't worry about these terms ui business logic data access layer if we have to relate this to our mvc architecture the view is the ui business logic and data access is basically the model right the controller is not explicitly shown here but you can imagine that request go to one of the, uh, the there is a controller here which you know mediates between the uh, ui business logic and data access layers so in a monolithic architecture everything is clubbed together although you may have certain you know uh, well defined uh, paths uh, mvc model here but ultimately everything is clubbed together but in a microservices architecture the ui is still club but other things are split up so as you can see here uh, sorry this is not actually the uh, client this is actually uh, the database so uh, what was a single database in monolithic now becomes multiple databases what was a single you know data access layer or a business logic now becomes separate microservices so let's take example of a e-commerce site there could be one microservices for processing the orders or the shopping cart another microservices for managing the warehouse another microservices for you know uh, managing the delivery another microservices for payments processing all the payments another microservice let's say for your third party vendors who want to update their products into the system so that's another microservice so like this you may have a dozens of microservices in an e-commerce site so each microservice as can be the way i have explained it each microservice does something very specific now it it's perfectly possible that each microservice has its own database ultimately all these databases have to have some sort of a consistency so it's not that you know uh, uh, one microservice says that I, uh, a customer has ordered you know five items of product a but the warehouse microservice database says that you know uh, i don't have five items of uh, product a how can you place such an order so there should be some sort of a consistency among all the databases so with this understanding let's get into some of the pros and cons of microservices so let's start by comparing a monolith versus a microservice a monolith is a single deployable unit so like i showed earlier it's a single code base so it makes sense to deploy it. i mean you can't do it any other way you have to deploy the whole thing as one unit but that is not the case with microservices now that you have split your app into different microservices 
it is very natural that they all reside in different code bases and each one can be independently deployed so this is actually a good thing about microservices uh, because uh, you know it's possible that your order microservice is very mature but then your delivery microservice is not so mature there are a lot of bugs in that microservice so you may do more frequent updates to a delivery microservice whereas the rest of the app stays stable so this is one of the beauty of microservices application evolves uh, as a single unit whereas here it evolves separately this is again you know somewhat related to the previous point so it's possible that you know you may do infrequent releases of one microservice but more frequent releases of uh, another microservice complex complexity increases with time so this is something that is apparent in the devopedia you know uh, code base over time the code has become very complex and uh, you know maybe the team size also increases but this is not the case uh, with microservice no doubt complexity also increases because you are adding more features into the product but then you are managing complexity by partitioning partitioning the app into smaller manageable chunks so that is where you know uh, microservices plays an important role the fourth point is that uh, scaling in the case of monolith is limited to vertical scaling what do i mean by vertical scaling if i am using uh, a certain processor i have to upgrade the processor i have to uh, bring in more ram if my hosting provider says that you know your uh, app can have only 256 processes running in par parallel then i have to move to a higher server where i can have you know many more processes running in parallel so all that comes down to vertical scaling maybe a higher hardware higher processor more memory more number of processes and so forth whereas in the case of microservices you can do this but it makes more sense to scale horizontally each service can be, can be scaled separately for example you know you you can scale delivery services differently from the order service maybe you have you know only three instances for delivery even at your peak uh, time you have only three instances for the delivery microservice but then for your order service you may need maybe uh, 20 instances running so each microservice can be scaled independent, independently so that is one of again the beauty of microservices and obviously this has a cost impact you know to scale vertically for millions of users is literally impossible but you can do that easily with microservices reliability has its limits with monolith but here you have a higher reliability mainly because uh, microservices uh, typically are stateless so you if a particular instance crashes you can immediately spin off a new instance and uh, you have load balancing and stuff like that so that is what reliability means uh, uh, in this context monolith typically it's a single platform and technology so in the case of devopedia we use uh, joomla cms the la pro programming language of choice is uh, uh, php we use mysql as the database now whatever we do uh, we are doing uh, user management we are doing article management we are managing acronyms uh, we are managing dev coins everything has to use the same platform same technology that is not the case with microservices so each microservice can be managed by a separate team so one team may be versed in python another team may be versed well versed in uh, uh, javascript or node js another team may be using uh, rust so each microservice uh, can be using a different platform and a technology it really doesn't make a lot of difference to the app that brings all these microservices together database transactions actually this is uh, one of the uh, pros of monolith right your database is always consistent because everything uh, happens as a single transactions so it's not possible that you know you have placed an order but there is no inventory or uh, you know you have placed an order but delivery didn't happen because the transactions are all consistent 
that is not the case with microservices it's possible that one database goes out of consistency with another database but the main point about microservices is not immediate consistency but eventual consistency that is what they strive to achieve in other words if an order is placed now eventually maybe there is of course a time bound to it that depends on how the uh, app is architected but when we say eventually we can think of it like in a few minutes it could be 15 minutes maybe in an hour so eventually all the databases have to be consistent otherwise it will be chaotic in other words as an example an order is placed but uh, delivery uh, microservice did not get the notification an order is placed but uh, you know the warehouse microservice did not get a notification that the stock has to be updated so that is the kind of cons- uh, but eventually you know all the databases have to be consistent it all looks good but what are the problems with microservices why are we saying that sometimes monoliths make sense first thing is microservices introduce network latency so one microservice has to call another microservice so if an order is placed you know the warehouse microservice has to be notified but this is typically a network call an api call and uh, there is a latency involved here it is not immediate so contrast this with uh, uh, and and the reason for this network latency is remember that uh, in the interest of scalability and reliability all the microservices are not running on the same server they are actually running on the cloud they could be running they are running on a distributed architecture so they are all not running on the same uh, uh, server unreliable network calls so obviously a network call can fail uh, tcp ip gives you a certain level of reliability but still tcp ip can fail what happens if an order is placed but the delivery call did not go through or the warehouse call did not go through what action will so now it doesn't mean that your app will break it means that you have to do a lot more work to make sure your app is consistent when a network call fails there are certain patterns which you know the designer can follow to ensure that the order is reverted or maybe you make a repeated call a repeat call so there are certain patterns which the designer has to take care to overcome the unre- unreliable nature of the network need to orchestrate the services so i gave you an example earlier where one particular microservice crashes it doesn't matter to us because they are all stateless so we immediately spin off another microservice uh, what we mean is a instance of a particular microservice so these instances are uh, you know uh, coming up and going down on the fly but for all these so there could be hundreds of instances running uh, on the system and there is a need to orchestrate all these services so when an instance comes up you know uh, uh, somebody has to be updated for example a new warehouse instance comes up uh, the order in uh, order microservices instances they should know which are the ip addresses of the uh, new uh, instances so that is one example of orchestration so like this uh, you know orchestration is definitely de- required hard to debug problems because uh, that is the nature of uh, a distributed system firstly things are distributed secondly you know these things create additional problems network latency unreliable calls and services coming up and uh, uh, down on the fly all this make it difficult for you to debug problems same thing hard to design if you thought that at run time things were difficult even the design of uh, an app using microservices is tough one of the difficult things is exactly how do you partition the microservice into different uh, how do you partition the app into uh, distinct microservices i will not explain this further because we have another slide that explains this better and finally autonomous cross functional teams so every team you know uh, actually this is both a pro and a con because in the previous slide we said that you know uh, each microservice can have a different team and each team can be using a different technology and a platform 
so in one sense it is of course uh, a good thing but in another sense it is bad because now uh, these guys uh, they, they have to be uh, autonomous in other words they cannot make cross uh, uh, microservice calls i mean they cannot be too dependent on the services that other microservices are providing so it may be uh, not clear at this point but in a few uh, there is another slide which will explain this better so this is the slide uh, you know that makes it difficult for people to design microservices so somebody who is used to designing monoliths even if they have been an expert in mvc architecture it will not be obvious for them how to get a microservice architecture right and this is an example of that so what uh, the designers have done is they have taken a monolith and they have partitioned it into cleanly into two microservices so this is how the system started on day 0 it looks very clean two independent microservices and there is only one cross api call because let's assume that this is the order microservice and this is the delivery microservice so once the order is placed this will make an api call to the delivery microservice to process the delivery so it looks very clean one is order one is uh, delivery but then few weeks down the line few months down the line new people join the team then things start to change red lines start to appear suddenly somebody thinks okay i am doing a lot of calls uh, you know somebody looks at this green line and then they say okay i mean i can make an api call to the uh, delivery microservice so then they say then they add a bunch of logic in this microservice and then they start making more and more calls from the order service to the delivery microservice so among developers there is a term for this this is called a chatty app what is meant by chatty the very reason you design two microservices is because they occasionally co communicate they don't communicate very often but then somebody decided to add a lot of logic here and then make calls from this microservice now suddenly your app becomes very chatty then the same person thinks okay i have now added a bunch of uh, api calls from this microservice to this microservice and my manager said that this is not good so then one developer decided okay let's add this box here and these microservices will share some common code maybe common database now what started off as independence now you have added stuff which made it not so independent now both these microservices are now dependent on some common piece of code and naturally once you start adding these kind of intent dependencies the app goes out of control now you got lot of red uh, lines going back and forth and then somebody adds bunch of new stuff which is again common stuff so initially it was only common code now people added a common database which is shared by two microservices then somebody comes along they create a new microservice which will stitch together multiple databases so now this is the uh, developers worst nightmare if you thought monolith was bad a distributed monolith is even worse so what you have here is not only the headache of microservices but also the headache of a monolith so what you have uh, effectively managed to do is to build a distributed monolith which is the worst of both the worlds so the point i'm trying to make in this slide is that yes there may be a requirement as your app becomes more complex you may want to think about moving your app from monolith to microservices but the path is not going to be easy if you don't get your definition of domains and microservices right you will end up with what is called as a distributed monolith so the decision to transition from monolith to microservices is not a light one because you can easily end up with a system which is worse than your monolith with that cautionary note let's move on to the next slide which is is there an alternative so we uh, looked at uh, uh, sorry we looked at monolith 
uh, from a negative uh, context. I mean, that is how people who are in the microservices camp like to think of monoliths. Monolith is the worst of uh, the lot and we should all be doing microservices. But then uh, more recently in the last maybe uh, two to three years, the concept of modular monolith has come about. So what is a modular, modular monolith? Modular monolith is within the monolith. Is it possible to design your app in modules? So that each module can be independently delivered, independently deployed even. And uh, one of the uh, things that happened is, as an example, you know, Java 9 has this support for modules. So your app may be having uh, multiple jar files. Maybe you have nine modules and you are deploying, deploying it as multiple jar files. But uh, now in Java 9, uh, it has a, a feature whereby you can package, you know, each one and deploy each. Now I can't go into uh, deeper details of how this works because I am not familiar with Java. But uh, typically even in Python, you know, you, you, we use packages and each package can be deployed independently. So I'm sure in every language there is some uh, amount of support, support where your monolith can be broken up into modules and packages and each of those components can be independently deployed, independently developed. Maybe even ha having them independently as separate code bases. So what do we uh, achieve by this? What we are achieving is we are not taking the drastic decision of moving your monolith to a microservice architecture. There is an intermediate path where you can move it to a modular monolith. And this becomes easier if you are already kind of uh, having a well-defined architecture within your monolith. Your monolith is not a, what they call big uh, ball of mud. It is following a certain architecture. In our case, we are following an MVC architecture. And there is a way to transition that MVC architecture to what we call as a modular monolith. And typically in this modular monolith, UI layer, you have the service layer and you have the database layer. And all these are packaged as one particular module or a component or a package, whatever you want to call it. And this is another package or a module or a component. And this is the third one. So the question for you is, you know, I have just described to you this packaging in a vertical slice. That means the UI, the service layer and the database layer. When I say service layer is nothing more than an API layer. So all this are packaged as one uh, vertical slice. But question for us is, could we package it horizontally as a layered architecture? That means this is one package, this is another package, this is another package. Of course, you can do it uh, because uh, typically languages uh, are flexible enough to allow you to do this, but that is probably a bad thing, mainly because suppose you touch your order service, then you will have to touch multiple modules, multiple packages, if you are packaging it horizontally. But if you are packaging it vertically, your order service, let's say, is a separate package, maybe even a separate code base, and only this is touched. The other code bases are not touched. And this is exactly where we want to be, because if you package your uh, package your app vertically in vertical slices, you will end up with an architecture which is very similar to a microservice, because this is fundamentally what a microservice does. It has a service layer, a database layer, and this is what we call microservice. What I have not shown is the UI layer. Remember here, there is one more layer, which is the UI. I've not shown the UI layer. I have only shown the API layer and the database uh, layer. So now you may ask what happened to the UI layer. So if you remember our first slide, UI is still a monolith. In, in the case of a modular monolith, as well as in the case of microservices, the UI remains as a monolith. And uh, are there ways in which the UI can also be broken down? In fact, yes, the answer to that is yes, there is something called micro frontends where even the UI can be broken up into components. 
and this is a talk which uh, raja nagendra another one of our speakers he will be talk in a couple of days so watch out for that talk i think it's coming up this weekend either on a saturday or sunday so he is going to be talking about how to break up the ui into uh, independent parts so that is called micro front ends but the focus of this talk is really about microservices where we are splitting up only the api layer and the database layer so as a concluding slide uh, before we get into q and a so what is the devopedia roadmap currently we are obviously doing uh, monoliths but it's not a big ball of mud that that we have today the monolith that we have is somewhat structured we are following an mvc architecture and we have independent files and uh, folders to manage this so it's quite possible that we can transition this to a modular monolith but it's still not trivial to identify the right kind of boundaries for the Dev devopedia app so we know that article probably belongs to one module uh, one module uh, the management of acronyms probably another module dev coins another module user management another module so we can kind of conceptualize you know some of these modules but uh, i mean these are the initial thoughts but more deeper analysis is required before we can arrive at the right set of boundaries between uh, domains what about support from the language in uh, as you know joomla uses php and php has a new micro framework uh, called uh, lumen which is uh, modeled on laravel where apis can be delivered as packages so this might help us in building a modular monolith in php now you may be using a different language maybe you are using rust or uh, you know java or python so you have to find out in your own language what is the kind of support that you have from uh, frameworks to build a modular monolith and i am sure and uh, you know if it is not there there will be frameworks that are going to be emerging to support this sort of uh, architecture and like i said in my earlier slide uh, cli scripts today we are using it but in future we may deprecate cli scripts uh, because once apis become available uh, cli scripts will no longer be needed and as a concluding point uh, yes uh, mi migrate to microservices only if necessary so if somebody tells you that uh, yeah, why are uh, you still using monoliths uh, yes uh, you must be having a reason to defend i mean you must be able to defend yourself give the right reasons why you are still using monoliths so with that uh, i will pass on the floor to the audience uh, for q and a these are some of art, 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 some of the relevant articles that you can read up on devopedia uh, microservices domain driven design cohesion versus coupling solid design principles so some of these uh, uh, can help you uh, you know design the right sort of microservice architecture so now for q and a yeah arvind this is ramnathan here Yeah. While migrating from monolith to microservices is a challenge, uh, right from the scratch, if we think in the lines of microservices, maybe it's expensive, but would it be worth it? Uh, the answer is no, because uh, as you say, right from the outset, you want to design your app with microservices. But remember what I said in my one of the earlier slides. Uh, every app that comes to the market uh, if you go by lean uh, methodology and agile principles you want to get your product out to the customers as quickly as possible build a mvp first get your product out get feedback and then iterate now to get your mvp out if you are starting with microservices you are going to take a lot longer to build your app because you will be uh, uh, stuck in the design phase for a long uh, long time okay okay and uh, typically i mean if you have a team in place all well and good if you have the team which is experienced in distributed architecture well and good but mm -hmm. typically that is not the case in the market when you are a startup uh, uh, there is only so much you can do 
and uh, in uh, my particular case in the case of devopedia as a case study we did not have experience in building di distributed uh, systems we did not have the know how of cloud computing or microservices so we had to go with what we were familiar with and uh, as i said before uh, the mvp was ready in two days and in two weeks the product was out in the hands of uh, customers but if we had gone down the microservices route uh, it would have taken a lot longer maybe two months maybe even longer wouldn't the requirements be a lot simpler in the early stage uh, for it to do it quickly you may not have had so many things to start with so microservices wouldn't it have turned around quickly yeah but uh, when a person is not experienced you have to bring in an external expert to do it okay okay so the lack it's not of not about the requirements the person okay. in the uh, team is not experienced in doing microservices because by design it is uh, by uh, nature it is complex and even when you say you know uh, to some extent your point the question is valid uh, when this uh, system starts uh, you know it is very simple so it should be fairly easy to do it but then when your system is so simple it's very hard for you to figure out which are the uh, right domain boundaries you have no idea how your app is going to evolve so again it ties back to your uh, you know experience you have to kind of visualize you know okay this is what might be required in future this might come at a later stage but none of this is you know set in stone when the app starts remember a uh, lot of things that went into the current product came because our authors requested it because we were able to get our product into the hands of authors early on through feedback we understood like some of the authors they wanted drafts as a feature mm -hmm. Uh, somebody uh, and uh, when spam started coming into the system we felt that yes now a review system must be in place hmm. so many of these things were not foreseen got it got it thanks yeah actually i uh, see one more thing is you know it is not that you know you have to stay uh, start straight with uh, microservices you can actually build a monolith um, uh, monolith in a very modular way and then you know as uh, arvin said you know it is mostly a deployment model the way you package right and then deploy it on independent servers if you really do a very good modular modular code it is possible to convert easily convert monolith into microservices when required when required means you know when the load is really you know needs to be horizontal uh, you need to have that kind of scale otherwise it is not required yes thanks for sharing that in fact i want to give a little bit more explanation of what is happening you see uh, this this looks all fine uh, but uh, yeah you know actually it is not clear in this diagram but one thing uh, i want to point out is that uh, only apis from the service layer are exposed you are not going to expose anything from the data access layer and for this you know you have to uh, know how your language works in this case java uh, so if you look at any of the talks uh, on this particular topic of modular monolith there is a lot of uh, uh, discussion about how uh, classes or objects give uh, uh, give access of their internal members to external users so for example typically there are access modifiers in uh, classes uh, you guys may be familiar the typical access modifiers are public private and protected and this also you know has uh, relevance to the way uh, objects are inherited classes are inherited so it is uh, in some languages by default everything is public to make it private you have to be very explicit uh, and to make it pr private uh, in some languages it may be the opposite you know by default it may be private and then you have to add the keyword public to make it public and so forth so this public keyword is actually a problem because 
if you design de define for example a class in your data access layer and even when you are packaging this vertical slice as an independent package this becomes accessible to another package okay this is not what is uh, not how you do modular monolith monolith you want to be as close as possible to microservices so the uh, recommended practice is only from your service layer you have to make your apis public which means that you know from this service layer you should not be able to call anything directly from the data access layer of customer service so you have customer service production service order service so from he production service you should not be able to make a public call to customer data access the language should, he should help you there the language should by default make by default or when you are building it you should make all the calls to this data access layer private that means it is visible private in the sense it is visible only within the package that is what i mean now when you do that the production service the only way it can call do something with the customer service is to call the api public api of the customer service this is the only api that it can call it cannot make direct calls to the data access layers this makes a modular monolith a mirror image of what happens in a microservice because this is exactly what happens in a microservice one microservice cannot call the data access layer of another microservice it can mm. only call the api layer, layer of another microservice the same thing yeah. can now be achieved with modular monolith given that your language you know java 9 has the support for it given that your language has that support mm. okay uh, yes. Do you mind showing the code once uh, the directory structure, uh, Arvind? Oh yeah. Administrator uh, API. Yes. yes. So where you said the uh, modules views where is that code? Yeah, that is component inside component we have component content. So there we have controllers, models, views. So now yeah, go go to models. So models, we have a bunch of files. Then we have rules. So all the validation happens here. Okay, controller. So set of validation, then forms. So suppose you want to add a new field, uh, then you can add it here as an XML, and so on. Sure. Uh, show the controllers. Is there a similar name for views, controllers, and models? Similar name for. Yeah, I show the art. Yeah, so this is a controller file. Then there is a controller folder as well. So this is a entry point controller for file. Each model, for each model, do you have an associated controller or the associated views? Uh, for each model. Uh, yeah, yeah. So see, we are inside the component called content. So this component has three things: controllers, models, and views. They all relate to content. Okay. Uh, you have uh, so, what are the so other like components? That, uh, there are multiple uh, components. This is a contact component. So let's go back to our uh, website. Uh, so let's go to one particular article. So this is the article. So this article is displayed uh, mainly. It is a component uh, content, but then here you have a search bar. So this search bar makes use of the com search, which is a different component. Okay. So there is a different component here called search. Actually, uh, it's a bit complex. Uh, so that is defined as a module. So there is a module here called mod search. But then let me search for something DevOps. Enter. Now I go to a completely different page, which is not our original article layout. So this layout is coming from a different component called com search. Can you see here com search? Oh, okay. So com search has its own controller, has its own view, has its own model. And this view that you see here, default results. 
this is the view that you are, we are seeing here the results view excellent excellent i think yeah that way you are already modular enough only thing is when you want to do microservices you will have to deploy com search you know in one server or you know you have to decide you know can i you know deploy com search s login tags yeah. in a different server yeah uh, and when you do that you know make sure that you know the dependencies are minimized the chatting whatever yes, you yes. said so it is mostly a refactoring uh, exercise yeah any other questions if no other questions i will leave you with the last slide so to know more about microservices you can read up these articles this is a high level article more about domain driven design so when it comes to how to break up your app into the right set of domains typically each domain will be one microservice so this article gives you some uh, introduction to how to break up your app into suitable domains so there is a partic particular method methodology called domain driven design so this article talks about that and other general design uh, software design aspects cohesion versus coupling solid design principles which are kind of related to you know making a modular monolith or to microservices so i hope uh, you know you can enhance your understanding of this topic by reading these articles